If there is anyone out there who still doubts that America is a place where all things are possible, tonight is your answer. Wow, the election of President Barack Obama in 2008 was a watershed moment in American optimism. But it was soon followed by a grim uptick in racially motivated hate crimes. My next guest explains in his new book that it was part of the push and pull of racial progress in this country. He writes, quote, as I began reporting on the violence that followed the Obama election, I soon realized that it was easier to make sense of what happened by considering this era not as the launch of something new, but rather as the continuation of something long in motion. It would be nice to conclude that we've learned a lesson from this era of American white lash, but it's hard to look at the horizon and not see more horrors to come. That author joins me now, Wesley Lowry, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and author of the new book, American White Lash, A Changing Nation and the Cost of Progress. Wes, thank you very much for coming to the Saturday show. Talk a little bit about why you call the book American White Lash and how your book details the pattern of violence that has followed pretty much every moment of racial progress in this country. Of course. Thanks so much for uh, having me, Jonathan. It's always great to see you and spend the weekend with you here on the Saturday show. Um, this idea of white lash, right, is based on a few things that we know. First, that race is a social construct, not, not biological, and that here in the United States of America, uh, we have a system that was structured at its inception. Uh, to create that distinction between people who are white and people who are not. And that whiteness has changed over time, but that functionally and fundamentally, as different movements have tried to force us and change us and, and fight to have us become a multiracial democracy of equality and equity and justice, we've seen forces and people, the beneficiaries of that initial inequitable system, fight back. Well, the historian Carol Anderson writes in her book, White Rage, she writes about the idea that black advancement always is the thing that triggers white mm -hmm. violence. And again, that being the people who benefit from being socialized as white, who feel as if they have an advantage and feel as if that equalizing things will take something from them. And so what we've seen in this moment has been a spike and anxiety among white Americans. By the end of the Obama administration, 55% of white Americans believed they were racially discriminated against. And what we've also seen has been a coarsening of our rhetoric around immigration, about refugees, around black Americans, to appeal to those white racial anxieties through the rise of a openly nativist president to, to replace the black president. And what we've seen has been a big smirk and grin on the faces of white supremacist groups, of the actual terrorists who want to cause a race war and attack and kill, because they know that a increasingly anxious white majority in America who are being stoked by an openly bigoted uh, political movement, they know that's going to lead more people into their violent, dangerous movement. Right. That, that, that's a great segue into the question I was going to ask you, because you take a close look at recent cases of white racial violence. And so talk more about what you learned about how acts of racial terror figure into the white supremacist movement. Certainly. So one thing that's very interesting, right, is that there's a historian, David Chalmers. He writes uh, the definitive history of the Klan in a book called Hooded Americans, or Hooded Americanism. And he writes that for most of its history, the Klan and other white supremacist groups were dispositionally conservative, meaning that they were winning. We lived in a white supremacist society. Their goal was to keep things the way they were. But following the entrance of our country into multiracial democracy in the late 60s, that their tactic changes. They become radical and revolutionary. They're no longer winning. They're losing. And so now they're fighting to restructure the country back to the way it was. Now, that justifies more aggressive violence, um, more aggressive acts of terror. We start to see the rise of these extremely complex groups who are literally trying to spark a race war. Um, and beyond that, they shift. Uh, white supremacist leader Lewis Beam writes in the in the eighties that they shift to a quote unquote leaderless resistance model. We think about this as quote unquote lone wolves very often. Mm -hmm. That their aim is to build these 
bureaucratic systems and goals and membership organizations, but their aim is to put their toxic propaganda out into the world, via the internet, via pamphlets, via television shows, via the mainstream politics, so that an individual can become radicalized. And so we see this with Timothy McVeigh, we see this with Dylan Roof, we see this with the shooter in El Paso and in Buffalo. They're not members of these big organizational hierarchical groups. They, these are white Americans who have racialized prejudice, who locate the writings and the message boards of these, of these violent white supremacists and what their marching orders are become very clear, and then they carry them out. And real quickly, Wes, and I, this question, you could go on for another 30 minutes, but we've got about 45 <laughs> seconds. You discussed the problem with the media being unwilling to call racism and bigotry by their rightful names as we head into the next presidential election. Uh, real quickly, your fears about the media's coverage of Donald Trump's campaign and the rest of the Republican field. Have we in the media writ large learned our lesson from 2016? Unfortunately, I don't think we have. Uh, one thing I think is really important is that in our multiracial democracy, our institutions, including the media, we are the guardrails, right? We're not gatekeepers, but we are facilitators of the public square. And so it is our job to be to help enforce where the guidelines are. There should be some repercussion if someone traffics in open, explicit bigotry and dehumanizing language against other people. Because when you dehumanize people, some of our residents and our citizens stop treating those people as humans, and that's when we see the violence that we've seen. Well, Wes, you and I both know that you, I, and a bunch of other journalists of color were, were ringing the alarm in 16 and in 15 and 16. Nobody wanted to listen to us then. Wesley Lowry, thank you very much for coming to the Sunday show, Congra Saturday show. Congratulations on the book.